good morning, church. It is awesome to see all you guys out there, all you at home. I hope you're ready to worship this morning. So let's go ahead and stand. Let's see a victory this morning. church, your people, God. Make us, mold us, shape us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I'll sing you take with the enemy.
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me, never gonna let me down. Oh, don't let me sing it for you this morning. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. things for good. I have a few announcements I'm going to give to you all. Yes, uh, please be seated. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the first announcement is thank you all for giving to the Chasm Thanksgiving dinner. We have exceeded our giving by $285. That is awesome. So yes, thank God for that. That is a huge blessing to our community. Uh, the next uh, announcement I have is that Living Nativity is happening. So after this service, our challenge is that everyone here goes on our website and our events, events page and click on the link to register. And so with everything being canceled and postponed or almost everything being canceled or postponed or we've had things in our life, events in our life being canceled or postponed, we really believe that this event, Living Nativity, will be a huge blessing to our community because of events for them that have been canceled or postponed. So we really challenge everyone here to be involved in some way, to be a light to our community, to uh, remind the community what Christmas is all about, that it's for Jesus, the Savior of the world who came to earth. And so we want to share that with our community, so please be involved. Beginning next Sunday, we are going back to our regular scheduled uh, worship time. So we will have 9 o'clock and an 11 o'clock service. So beginning next Sunday, we'll be going back to our 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. Please register beforehand. So we'll keep that part uh, continuing. Men's breakfast will be on November 7th. And we still have a few t-shirts left. So if you all are interested in buying a t-shirt, Please contact Meredith and she will help you with that. Let's pray over the offering before I introduce our preacher for this morning. God, we thank you for all of the gifts that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this Sunday morning, God, that we are able to be in the house of the Lord. We pray, God, for an increase of your presence, God. We pray for a blessing over this message for Robbie and the message, Lord. And I pray that it will uh, speak to everyone in a unique way, Lord, so that we may leave this place changed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I have the privilege and the honor to introduce Robbie. I first met Robbie last summer and I was able to hear his passion for Jesus and the ministry and it's very evident in the way he would talk about uh, Jesus and ministry but also over his life. Uh, Robbie grew up in this church. This is his home church and he is also a first year seminary student at Union Presbyterian Seminary. So let's welcome Robbie. Woo. Wow, uh, 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, super excited, grateful, and thankful uh, to have this opportunity to be uh, to open up God's Word with you all this morning. Uh, I'd just like to thank Miss Osborne uh, for asking me uh, to be here, and Pastor David for letting this happen. Uh, but before I dive into Scripture, and if you didn't know, our Scripture reading is going to be from uh, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. I thought it'd be best if I set the stage a little bit on what we're going to be discussing. You see, when Miss Osborne asked me to speak, I mean, I got to be honest, I was, I was incredibly hesitant to say yes, and honestly, I was pretty fearful. I was fearful I was going to come up here and I was going to stumble through my words. I still might do that, who knows? Hopefully the Spirit's going to be working through. I was fearful that I wasn't ready for this, that I was inadequate. And I was fearful uh, that I wasn't going to have the time necessary to prepare with, with school and other priorities I had going on. All that to say, this is just one instance in my life that stirred up a lot of fear. And in all reality, I think many of you, if not all of you, uh, struggle with fear throughout our day-to-day lives, especially in this time we are currently in. I think some of us, we may fear a a diagnosis or the effects that come from a diagnosis. Uh, Some of us fear rejection or, or not being accepted by maybe our friends, our family members, our coworkers for who we truly are. A lot of us fear maybe in this time, you know, not maybe losing a job or uh, not getting a job that we hope for. I think many of us fear failure. Uh, I mean, I think that's a really common denominator among us or, you know, not meeting the expectations that we've set for ourselves or that somebody else has set for us. I think specifically we have a fear uh, this time we're in right now with COVID-19 and this upcoming election. I think a lot of fear can come from that. And all this to say, I think fear ultimately, it comes from, I think a lot of it has to come from the fear of the future. I think a lot of it comes from change and our inability to uh, want to change. And it comes from just the fear of the unknown. You see, we're so used to having control over our everyday lives. And so as soon as that control is ripped from us, I think it can cause a lot of fear among us. I truly believe that fear has taken a grip and in a sense, Uh, paralyzed our world, our communities, our churches, our families, and most importantly, us as individuals. You see, fear paralyzes us because it keeps us from being in pursuit of a deeper and fuller relationship with God. I truly believe the opposite of faith is fear because fear paralyzes us, but faith always produces action. And so the question I hope we can answer today is simply how do we paralyze fear? Is it possible? Is it something we can do? We know fear paralyzes us, but can we paralyze fear? So we're going to take a look at an example today in Scripture of, of a group of people that were paralyzed by fear. They were consumed by it. And we're going to see how they overcame it. Did they overcome it? And a little context uh, from John chapter 20, which is where we're going to be. Uh, it details the events directly after the resurrection of Jesus. In the beginning of John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene uh, is a witness to the empty tomb. And then the disciples of Jesus, Peter and John, go and witness the empty tomb as well. And then Mary Magdalene has an encounter with the risen Jesus. And where we're going to reside today is the disciples' uh, encounter with Jesus. So let's read uh, the word of the Lord together. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Amen. And so we see right away that these disciples, I mean, they're consumed with fear. They've locked themselves in this room. Uh, They're huddled together, and they don't, they're pretty much just scared of the Jewish authorities. And they were fearful of the Jewish authorities because the Jewish authorities had just killed their leader, Jesus, and they're like, well, you know what, we're next. We're going to die. So we just got to get as far away from these Jewish authorities as possible. But what's so fascinating about this is that this fear of the Jews, this fear of the Jewish authorities, and and my phrase, uh, fear of the Jews specifically, is is not mentioned just this one time in the book of John. In fact, it's mentioned three times in the book of John. 
And what this signifies is that this is a reoccurring fear uh, that the disciples had. And I think a lot of us, you know, we have deeply rooted fears that have consisted and been with us for years, maybe months, maybe weeks, but they continue to resurface. I mean, every time we think we've overcome this fear, or every time we think we've defeated this fear, it constantly uh, comes back. And for example, for me, uh, my, one of my biggest fears is dogs. I have a massive fear of dogs. Well, I'm good with small dogs, but like, if I was in front of a German Shepherd or a Great Dane, I'm, te- I'm petrified. I mean, that's just a reoccurring fear, a resurfacing fear uh, that's been rooted in me. And we all have them specific and unique uh, to our personal being. And this is the same thing the disciples were dealing with, this reoccurring fear. But the thing is, if if we think about the disciples for a minute, I mean, they have walked with Jesus for the past three years of his ministry. They've heard Jesus preach. They've heard him teach. They've seen him do miracles. They've broke bread with Jesus. They know Jesus Even over the past several chapters of John, Jesus has specifically told them, hey, I'm going to be captured and handed over to the chief priest. I'm going to be crucified, died, and buried. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And they still don't get it. I think the reality is you can go through life hearing about Jesus. The disciples did. We can go through life having a knowledge of the gospel, whether it be going to church on Sundays, whether it be going to a Sunday school or a small group or just hearing about it through our friends and family. But the reality is we can still lock ourselves behind a door of fear and unbelief because we think fear is greater than the God that we worship. And that brings me uh, to my first point uh, this morning. How do we paralyze fear? Well, it's understanding that the God we serve is greater than any fear that can be put before us. You see, I think so many times, we're all guilty of it in our lives, we put the focus on ourselves. All that matters is our careers, our successes, our choices, our hopes and our dreams. It's all about me. My dad, uh, he has a, he's got this famous saying. Uh, I say it famous because he, he says it all the time. He says, this is our family motto. I want it all and I want it all now. If that isn't the truest statement to our world today, I don't know what is. The world has discipled us to become all about us. It's this world of self-empowerment. And I got to be honest with you, every time I put the focus on myself, I feel more pressure, I feel more anxiety, and ultimately I feel more fear. Because guess what? The expectations that the world sets for us, we will never be able to reach. I'm a broken sinner and I sin every day. And my need for Jesus gets greater and greater every single day. And I think when we turn our eyes and put our focus on Jesus and we pursue a relationship with him, that mindset of fear, it turns into just a mindset of, I'm just going to follow. Yeah, Jesus, you know, I might have some doubts. Yes, Jesus, this is hard. We're living in tough times, but I'm just going to follow you because my being was created to glorify you. We were created in the image of God to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves. And that is something we have to just understand in this world we live in today. And so continuing on, we know that the disciples, they're locked in this room, they're consumed by fear, and then out of nowhere, the unexpected happens, Jesus enters the room. The scripture says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And so what stands out to me in this section is simply that Jesus greets the disciples, not once but twice with this same phrase, peace be with you. I mean, there's got to be meaning and significance to that, right? And actually, there's two reasons why Jesus repeats this phrase, peace be with you. The first is because the disciples actually didn't recognize that it was Jesus when he first entered the room. It wasn't until Jesus showed them his hands and his side that they rejoiced in seeing the Lord. That, oh, that, that's Jesus. I don't know what they saw the first time, but it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't Jesus. And the second reason why he repeats this phrase, peace be with you, is because Jesus is fulfilling a promise that he made uh, to the disciples in an earlier chapter of John. In fact, if you go to John 14, uh, verse 27, before Jesus was crucified, before he was taken uh, by the chief priests, He's just with the disciples, and he says this. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so Jesus is handing them, giving them the gift of peace. And they cannot receive this gift of peace until they know who's speaking to them is Jesus. And so that's why he repeats this statement. And this is ultimately an explicit reminder to the disciples that, hey, when when you meet with Jewish authorities, when you encounter 
these Jewish authorities that you're so scared of, you need not do so anxiously, but with the peace that I give to you. And in the same sense, if we put our hope and trust in Jesus, there's hope that the gift of peace is with us too, the peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that, you know, when you go through storms or when you go through trials, I mean, that gift of peace is hard to rely on. Once again, we're so focused on us and our own worries and concerns that, you know, relying and, and, and feeling that gift of peace can be difficult. But I'm here to tell you today, it is there if you put your eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. See, our, our need for Jesus is greater uh, than any need uh, that stands before us. And so right after Jesus brings peace upon the disciples, he doesn't say, hey, peace I give to you, I'm out. He says, peace I give to you, and he commissions them. It says, Jesus says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So back when I was a, a freshman in college, I played pickup basketball, and I was about the second week I was there, and after we were done playing, uh, this guy that I played with comes up to me. didn't know him at all. His name was Cam. He introduced himself, and he was like, hey, man, like, what are you doing on Friday nights? I mean, Friday nights of all nights, what are you doing? Because we have this ministry night where we go out in, in the surrounding community, and we'll, we play pickup basketball, and then we present the gospel uh, to them. And what, what, what Cam shows here is what I want to get to the second point of how do we paralyze fear? You step out in full confidence with the mission that God has entrusted you with. See, Cam didn't know me. So he could have said, you know what? This guy, somebody else can evangelize to him. Somebody else can pu push him uh, to get involved in ministry. Cam could have been like, you know what? This guy goes to Liberty University. He's already probably involved in ministry. I don't need to do it. And Cam could have been fearful like a lot of us are in those situations. He didn't even have to go up to me. He could have been like, you know what? I don't know. This is un too much unknown territory. He could reject me. I'm just not going to ask. But Cam stepped out with full confidence in the mission of God. And in the same way, we are placed in positions each and every day to impact the kingdom of God. I know, you know, it's different now because you have Zoom meetings and we're not always, you know, at work or, or, you know, wherever your place, wherever your setting of work is. But whether it's through a phone call, whether it's just going to lunch one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you know, we have these opportunities to step out in faith and confidence and, and complete the mission of God. You see, I think the more and more we, we go out with, with, with confidence and comfort, I mean, the more comfort will come with it. Um, and I just want to make this point. I think it's really important to evangelize unbelievers. But right now, we need to have these conversations with fellows, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ too. I mean, we go through hills and valleys, and in this time, it can be a struggle. And we need one another to say, you know what? Tonight, Tuesday night, 6.15 to 6.45, I think is when the time is. Like, I'm going to go to this prayer meeting. You should come too. Because we all need to have encounters with Jesus. And so pursuing these conversations with believers is incredibly important as well. And so after Christ commissions the disciples out, it says this. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And this brings me to my third and final point. How do we paralyze fear? Well, it's recognizing that Christ is with you and he has something he wants to do through you and in you right where you are. That's a shout out to Pastor Tuck. He said that every single Sunday and I was like, that just stuck with me. And the reality is, through salvation, we have been given a free gift of the Holy Spirit that can work through us and in us. And sometimes when we're in these conversations with unbelievers or believers, we feel like it's all on us, that we have control over, over their hearts. But in reality, it's the Spirit that works through us uh, to impact, convict, and pierce the hearts of, of everyone. But I can't help but notice uh, something specific in this passage, and it, it's really, it really stands out to me. When Jesus says, and when he said this, he breathed on them. And Jesus breathed on the disciples. I mean, I don't think that's, you know, something we, we do regularly uh, in the world today. I mean, especially today. I mean, we're not going to, I'm not just going to breathe on somebody. It's not going to happen. And I'd go to, that would be bad. Um, but there's got to be significance to it, right? I mean, he breathed on the disciples. And if we go all the way back to Genesis 2, when God creates the first human being, Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed into the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And so we see God breathe life 
into this man. And what's so fascinating is I learned this over the I took Hebrew over the summer, and so I learned this. I learned some words. And one of the words I learned was, was the word for ruach, which means breath or spirit. And that's the same word uh, God uses when he breathes life into the man. But what's fascinating is in John chapter 20, in Greek, uh, Jesus breathed in on the disciples. The word is pneuma. Like, I think it's short for pneumonia probably. But... Uh, <laughs> That same word means breath or spirit. And so we can see there is a distinct parallel between John chapter 20 and Genesis 2. But we got to dive a little bit deeper to really uh, see the significance of it. You see, Scripture wants us to know that the very first human being got face to face with the Almighty God. And Almighty God breathed life into this first human being. And when he did that, when he breathed the Ruah of life into him, that began a perfect and unified face to face relationship between man and God. And as uh, some of you know in here, that face-to-face relationship with God, I mean, it did not last long at all. Uh, As in Genesis 3, we know man and woman sin, and that forever fractures that relationship between man and God. Uh, God punishes Adam and Eve accordingly and then kicks them out of the garden. And and, and so that face-to-face relationship no longer existed. And if you look throughout the entire Old Testament, there was no face-to-face relationship. Just look at Moses. Moses, the giver of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 33, he's like... God, let me see your glory. I want to see your face. And I was like, absolutely not. You're going to get the afterglow. And that's a very loose translation, yes, but if you read Exodus 33, you'll see what I'm saying is is the truth. Um, But as we see in in, uh, the Old Testament, there was no face-to-face relationship between God and man, but everything changed through the person and work of Christ. See, the reality is everyone in this room, myself, big time, is a broken sinner in need of a Savior. And the heart of our problem is that we have a problem in our hearts. We sin, we reject, and we turn away from an almighty God which requires an infinite punishment. It's just the truth. And the reality is, to make this punishment, we cannot do anything on our own to make it. That's where Jesus comes in. Jesus comes in and says, you know what, I'm going to make the payment. I'm going to do it. And as Jesus is taking his final breath on the cross, he says, it is finished. And what is finished is simply the full payment required to take away our sins, but there's more, and this is what's really cool. So when Jesus says, it is finished, an earthquake hits Jerusalem, the temple shakes, and the veil that separates the people of God from the presence of God is torn from top to bottom, and there is no longer a barrier that separates the people of God from the presence of God. In fact, we can be reconciled with God, which simply means we can go back to the way it was. That's what reconciled means. And when Jesus is raised from the dead on the third day, he goes into this room with his disciples, comes face to face with them, and he says, receive the ruach of life. I'm going to reconcile this relationship back to Genesis 2, to where you were first created. Let's start this thing over. And in the same way, that's what he wants to do in this room right now. That's what he wants to do across the world. He wants us to receive the breath of life, which is the Holy Spirit, and begin a new relationship, or renew a relationship with him. It's, it's just, in, it's incredible. You see, every single one of us has, will experience fear in our lives. It's just, it's just the fact. It's just the reality. Whether it be the fear of change, whether it be the fear of the coronavirus, whether it be the fear of failure. But the thing is, every single one of us that experience fear, that is temporary. See, when we experience fear, that fades. Yes, it may resurface, and yes, it will, may reoccur in our lives, but it's temporary. But the hope that is found in a relationship with Christ, it's everlasting, it's never-ending, and it's forever fulfilling. You see, paralyzing fear, I said all those points, but the reality is it cannot be overcome by our own power and merit. It just won't be. We can only paralyze fear through the power of Christ and the hope we find in relationship with him. And so my prayer and encouragement uh, for you that are believers in this room and believers online is to continue to pursue and deepen your relationship with Christ. Yes, you're going to experience fear, but I'm telling you the hope that we find in Christ is greater than that. And so if you're an unbeliever in this room or online, I would just like to say that that cross is kind of for you. I just want to finish by saying this one thing. You know, a lot of times we look at Christ and we're just like, this is just a belief. We just have to believe in Christ. But Christ is not just some truth to be believed in. I'm telling you, 
He is the ultimate treasure of life and life itself. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. God, there's so much fear in, in this world. There's so much animosity. There's so much angst and concern. And God, your hope, we can find hope in your cross, that you rose from the dead, that you defeated death, and that we can find salvation through belief and trust in you. And so I pray for each and every person in this room and each and every person that's watching this. God, you are not just some truth to be believed in, but you are the treasure of all life itself. And I pray that we would be convicted, that we would tear down our walls of unbelief, and that we would put our full trust and faith in you. And it's your name I pray, amen. Trust roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I pain is broke. This is all I know. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand.
So Robbie has just laid it out there, right? I am so amped right now. It's unbelievable. And I, I can't, if you're not amped, I, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you come talk to me. All right? If you know someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ, you go talk to them. It's black and white. It's plain and it's simple. Thank you, Robbie. That's what we needed this morning. Don't be paralyzed by that conversation because there's nothing that our God cannot do. Amen? Let's sing it out. Let's mean it.
the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Amen.